The semiconductor industry has always been a battlefield of global power. But what's unfolding between China and the Netherlands right now is unlike anything we've seen before. A Chinese-owned chip maker, operating peacefully in Europe for years, suddenly finds itself at the center of an international crisis. Production lines frozen, assets seized, management removed. And now Beijing has drawn a line in the sand. Fix this within six months or face an $8 billion compensation claim through international arbitration. This isn't just another trade dispute. This is about the rules of global investment, the limits of national security claims, and what happens when a small European nation becomes the front line in a much larger economic war. If you want to stay informed about the stories shaping our world's economy and geopolitics, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. You won't want to miss what comes next. Let's dive in. When Europe joined the semiconductor blockade, for years, when people discussed restrictions on China's technology sector, one name dominated the conversation, the United States. And for good reason. Washington has led the charge in imposing export controls, blacklisting companies, and pressuring allies to cut off Beijing's access to advanced semiconductor technology. But America hasn't been acting alone. Quietly, steadily, Europe has been tightening its own grip. From Brussels to Berlin, from Paris to The Hague, European governments have rolled out increasingly strict policies governing the export of high-end chips and critical manufacturing equipment to China. The language is always careful. Compliance reviews, national security assessments, technology export framework updates. It all sounds reasonable, even procedural. But behind the bureaucratic language lies a harder reality. Companies have seen contracts canceled overnight. Supply chains have been severed without warning. Long-standing partnerships have collapsed under the weight of sudden regulatory intervention. And at the heart of one of the most dramatic cases sits a company called Nexperia. The rise of Nexperia, from NXP spin-off to Chinese success story. To understand what's happening now, we need to go back nearly a decade. Nexperia didn't start as a Chinese company. It began as a division within NXP Semiconductors, one of Europe's semiconductor giants. This division specialized in discrete components and automotive-grade power chips, not the flashiest technology, but essential building blocks that powered everything from car engines to industrial machinery. For NXP, it was a steady cash generator. Then came 2016. American chipmaker Qualcomm announced plans to acquire NXP in a massive deal. But European antitrust regulators weren't going to approve the merger without conditions. One of those conditions, NXP had to sell off its discrete components division to prevent market concentration. And so, Nexperia was born, carved out, restructured, and set adrift as an independent entity. But independence came at a cost. Without the backing of its former parent company, Nexperia struggled. Profits evaporated. Losses mounted. The newly independent company needed a lifeline. That lifeline came from China. In 2017, a Chinese investment consortium led by Wingtech Technology stepped in. The acquisition happened in two phases, with a total price tag of approximately $3.9 billion. When the deal closed, Nexperia became fully controlled by Chinese investors. Here's what's crucial. At the time, European regulators raised no objections. There was no national security review, no media firestorm, no political intervention. The transaction was processed as a routine, market-driven acquisition, exactly the kind of cross-border investment that the global economy is supposed to encourage. A textbook turnaround. What happened next looked like a business school case study in successful international acquisition, Nexperia's new Chinese owners didn't gut the company or strip its assets. They invested. They kept the European research and development centers intact. They maintained manufacturing facilities across the continent. The management team remained largely local, Europeans running a European company just with Chinese shareholders. Under this new ownership structure, Nexperia refocused on what it did best, producing the specialized chips that modern vehicles and industrial systems can't function without. 
These aren't cutting-edge processors measured in nanometers. But in terms of market share for automotive electronics, industrial control systems, and power management components, Nexperia became a global leader. The company's client list read like a who's who of the automotive world. Bosch, Continental, ZF, Denso. These weren't small contracts. They were strategic, long-term partnerships built on reliability and scale. Within just a few years, Nexperia went from bleeding red ink to posting consistent profits. For Europe, this meant thousands of local jobs preserved and expanded. For China, it was validation that Chinese capital could successfully integrate into and strengthen the global supply chain. By every conventional metric, employment, revenue, industrial contribution, this was a win-win scenario. And then without warning, everything changed. September 30th, 2025. The day everything froze. On the last day of September 2025, the Dutch government made an unprecedented move. Citing national security and economic security concerns, the Netherlands issued a ministerial order to intervene in Nexperia's operations. The scope of the intervention was staggering. 30 legal entities worldwide, covering approximately $14.7 billion in assets, were frozen for one year. But, you know, it didn't stop there. The authority of Nexperia's management was gutted. Every personnel decision, every major business choice, now required Dutch government approval. The government reserved the right not just to review, but to veto or even reverse company decisions. Within days, the management team sent by Wingtech Technology, including the company's Chinese CEO, was forcibly removed from operational control. These executives, who had been running the company successfully for years, were suddenly barred from their own offices. Then came the most controversial demand of all. The Dutch government put forward what it called a restructuring plan. The plan required Wingtech to surrender 99% of its ownership stake in Nexperia. In exchange, the Chinese investors would be allowed to keep a single symbolic share, essentially meaningless. To many international observers, this didn't look like regulation. It looked like confiscation. China's counterstrike, the 70% solution. Beijing's response came swiftly, just three days after the Dutch announcement. Chinese regulatory authorities issued an export control order targeting Nexperia's operations within China. The directive was simple but devastating. Nexperia's Chinese production facilities were prohibited from shipping any finished components or parts overseas. Here's why that matters. Approximately 70% of Nexperia's global production capacity is located in China. The company's European manufacturing footprint is, by comparison, minimal. With a single regulatory stroke, China effectively severed the arteries of Nexperia's supply chain. Think about the irony here. The Netherlands claimed it was seizing control of Nexperia to protect national and economic security. But if the Dutch government now controls 99% of the company, it also inherits 100% of the company's contractual obligations. And those obligations include delivering millions of chips to customers across Europe, Asia, and beyond. But now, those chips can't be manufactured. The production lines are in China, and China has shut off the tap. Every delayed shipment, every broken contract, every frustrated customer, the legal and financial liability now falls on the Dutch government. The automotive industry starts to panic. Nexperia generates roughly 60% of its revenue from the automotive sector. Based on annual revenue figures of approximately $2 billion, that translates to about $1.2 billion in automotive-related sales. The client list includes some of the biggest names in the industry. Bosch, Continental, ZF from Europe, and Denso from Japan. These companies don't just buy chips from Nexperia as a convenience, they depend on them. In many cases, Nexperia's components are designed into vehicle platforms years in advance. Switching suppliers isn't a matter of weeks or months. It can take years and cost hundreds of millions. And right now, Nexperia can barely deliver anything. 
New orders are stalled. Long-term contracts are in jeopardy. In some cases, partnerships have been terminated outright because there's no clear timeline for when supply might resume. The uncertainty has become unbearable. Major European automakers have begun applying intense pressure on the Dutch government. The message is clear. If this isn't resolved quickly, entire production lines will shut down. Cars that were supposed to roll off assembly lines will sit incomplete. Billions in revenue will evaporate, and the suppliers have no backup plan because the entire supply chain was built around Nexperia's unique position in the market. Against this escalating crisis, China has now made its intentions crystal clear. In December 2025, the Chinese government delivered a formal ultimatum to the Netherlands. The demand was clear. Restore Wingtech Technologies' lawful control over Nexperia within six months. If that doesn't happen, China will initiate international arbitration proceedings and seek uh, approximately $8 billion in compensation. At first glance, $8 billion might sound excessive, maybe even punitive. But when you examine the calculation behind it, the number becomes, honestly, much harder to dismiss. Let's start with the original acquisition cost, $3.9 billion in cash, paid up front back in 2017. That's a documented, indisputable transaction. Then, you've got to consider the investments made afterward. Over the six years following the acquisition, Wingtech poured substantial capital into Nexperia, expanding manufacturing capacity, upgrading technology infrastructure, building out global distribution networks, increasing research and development budgets, and integrating the company more deeply into both upstream and downstream supply chains. Based on publicly available financial disclosures and industry analysis, these post-acquisition investments are estimated to exceed $1 billion. Now, add the appreciation in the company's value. Between 2017 and 2025, Nexperia transformed from a struggling spin-off into a highly profitable, strategically positioned global supplier. That increase in enterprise value is a legitimate component of any compensation claim. So when you stack these figures together, initial purchase price, subsequent investments, and value appreciation, $8 billion starts to look less like an inflated demand and more like a grounded calculation. But there's another dimension to this standoff. If the Dutch government continues to ignore China's demands, the export control measures will remain in place. And, well, a Nexperia controlled by the Netherlands but unable to access 70% of its production capacity becomes, in practical terms, worthless. The real question isn't whether China's claim is justified. The real question is, if this goes to international arbitration, can China actually win? Can China win in international court? From a legal standpoint, China's position is actually stronger than many people realize. Multiple independent legal analyses have identified significant procedural problems with how the Dutch government handled the Nexperia intervention. The process, you know, really lacked transparency. The legal justification appears, well, pretty thin. And in certain critical phases, the Dutch government's actions seem to deviate from the multilateral investment protection treaties it has signed. These aren't just minor technicalities. They're actually fundamental violations of international investment law. That said, winning an arbitration case and actually collecting compensation are two very different things. Even if an international tribunal rules in China's favor, there's no guarantee the Netherlands will write a check for $8 billion. In fact, history suggests it probably won't. The Spanish precedent, winning the case, Losing the money. Consider the case of Spain. Back in 2013, the Spanish government retroactively slashed subsidies it had promised to renewable energy investors. That move triggered more than 50 international arbitration cases filed by foreign investors under the Energy Charter Treaty. The total compensation demanded exceeded 11 billion euros. Spain lost case after case. Arbitration tribunals repeatedly ruled that Spain had violated its treaty obligations. 
So far, the confirmed amount Spain owes exceeds 1.5 billion euros. But here's the problem. Spain has been dragging its feet for over a decade. In the XID infrastructure case, Spain lost the arbitration but refused to enforce the ruling in its own courts. Investors had to chase Spanish assets in other countries just to recover a fraction of what they were owed. The Nextera case followed a similar pattern. After losing the arbitration, Spain delayed and delayed. To this day, full compensation hasn't been paid. This is the uncomfortable reality of international arbitration. Winning is relatively straightforward if the law is on your side. But enforcement is another matter entirely. There's just no global police force that can compel a sovereign nation to pay. Applied to the China-Netherlands dispute, even if China wins decisively in arbitration, it will likely recover only a portion of the claimed $8 billion, or settle through prolonged negotiation. Why the Netherlands still has everything to lose. But don't mistake partial recovery for a Dutch victory. Even if the Netherlands only pays a fraction of the claim, the damage will extend far beyond the immediate financial cost. First, any compensation payment, even partial, establishes legal responsibility. It sets a precedent that the Dutch government acted unlawfully. Second, and perhaps more importantly, the entire arbitration process will send a chilling signal to international investors. The message, the Netherlands is willing to seize foreign-owned assets on vague national security grounds, and it won't necessarily follow its own legal commitments. For a country like the Netherlands, which relies heavily on foreign direct investment and positions itself as a stable, predictable destination for global capital, that reputational damage could be catastrophic. Multinational corporations will think twice before establishing European headquarters in Amsterdam. Sovereign wealth funds will reconsider allocating capital to Dutch assets. And other countries watching this case will draw their own conclusions about the reliability of European investment protections. In that sense, the arbitration itself, regardless of the final payout, becomes the punishment. What this really means. The Nexperia case isn't just about one company or one country. It's a stress test of the entire post-World War II international economic order. For decades, that order was built on a set of shared assumptions. That property rights would be respected across borders. That investment treaties would be honored. That disputes would be resolved through law rather than power. But what happens when national security becomes an all-purpose justification for tearing up those rules? What happens when a government can seize a foreign company's assets, not because the company broke any law, but simply because geopolitical winds have shifted? China is betting that the international system still has enough integrity to hold the Netherlands accountable. The Netherlands is betting that in the new era of strategic competition, old rules no longer apply. One of them is about to be proven wrong, and the answer will shape not just the future of Nexperia, but the future of global investment itself, at a time when, honestly, the world can least afford more uncertainty. So where do you stand? Is this a legitimate national security intervention, or an act of economic plunder dressed in legal language? The next six months will tell us whether international law still means something, or whether we've already entered a world where might makes right, and the biggest loser is the global economy we all depend on.